Go, see, my betrayer is near. This is a reading of the Lord's word. Thanks, Dean. You guys could have a seat. Uh, my name is Ricky. I serve as one of the pastors here, so glad to have you guys here. And, um, you know, today, Good Friday, we, we, in anticipation of Easter, just kind of take some time to, to reflect, to remember the, the Friday when Jesus, our, our Lord and Savior, was handed, was betrayed, was handed over to be crucified, and, and eventually went to the cross and died. And, you know, it, it, it's this thing in the moment where without Easter, it's really heavy. And it, I mean, it's even with Easter, it's heavy, because it's this thing of like, man, Jesus is going to his death, and he's going to his death so that he can die for you and I, right? so that he can pay the price for, for our sin. And so, yeah, let me just pray as we just dive into his word. <laughs> Lord, Jesus, we thank you that... Um, yeah, that as we think, as we pause and just remember, Lord, that this, that you are God. Lord, that, that this is the basis of our salvation, this is the basis of our faith, Lord, is that Jesus, you came, you died, and you rose again. And so, Lord, help us as we just look back at your death and what does that mean? Not just what does it mean back then, but what does it mean right now? What does it mean for us? Help these truths to just be what they actually are, just utterly beautiful, utterly life-changing. And um, yeah, we just thank you, Lord, that you are a sacrificial God. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And I just invite you to, to think, to kind of imagine a little bit as Jesus his disciples, they've been in Jerusalem. It's almost 2,000 years ago. The city is just bursting with people, lots of activity, people buying things, people talking, <coughs> preparing food to celebrate the, the Jewish Passover, which is the, the, like their biggest holiday. And, and Jesus himself, you know, he had been in the upper room and he had washed his disciples' feet. He had celebrated the Passover meal with them. And now just out after that, Jesus is with his disciples and he's making his way just a little bit outside of the city. They're walking. And the sun is starting to, to set, starting to go down and now it's, it's dark and and it's chill is in the air. The, the trees have stopped blowing as much. And Jesus is with his closest companions. And as they walk to this place and he just comes and he says, hey, could you just be with me a while? And as, you know, if you're one of the disciples, you're seeing this distress on his face. And so we're going to just come as they, they're approaching this destination as they come to the Garden of Gethsemane. So if you've got a Bible, open up to Mark. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke. So it's in the New Testament, Mark 14. We're going to pick it up in verse 32. Mark 14, verse 32, it says this. Then they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he told his disciples... Sit here while I pray. And then he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he, go, he went just a little bit further, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. I just want to bring your attention to that, where it says he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. I mean, Jesus right now has a different feeling to him than his disciples have ever seen him. And he, he's, you know, some say like this word here is like he's almost horrified. 
He has this almost like an agony about him, a deep alarm. I mean, I think, you know, some, sometimes we could feel like we're distressed, we're greatly troubled when we're like trying to get ready for the holidays or when we're stuck in traffic or something like that. This is entirely way different than that. Jesus didn't just like stub his toe. He is in, under the, such distress You know, this is like gut-wrenching distress, devouring distress. He's in agony. And it says in verse 34, Jesus said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. I mean, we say some things like that. Man, I'm starving to death. Man, if I have to listen to any more Taylor Swift songs, I'm going to die. (laughs) Right? But Jesus here, he is not just using kind of some big language to express his emotion. He is expressing it precisely what is going on. Jesus is saying, I am such in horrified, deep alarm Distress. I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing such agony that I feel like I could literally die right now. Deeply grieved to the point of death. He's not being overly dramatic, overly sensitive. I mean, this sorrow that is on Jesus' heart, it brings him to even just the brink of death. And then he, you know, what could be doing that? And so verse 35 Jesus goes a little farther, then he just fell to the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible that this hour might pass from him, let let, let this moment pass from me. And so in this anxiety of Jesus, his you know, he's so weak, his feeling is so, such a weighty moment that his knees begin to wobble as he's walking and he just falls down. And he just begins to, to cry out, begins to pray to God, God, Father, if, it's, if, if this could not happen, if this moment, if this hour could not end up getting here, can you just please... Take this moment away from me. I mean, think about the man that is praying these words. Jesus. Jesus had always seemed so unflinching, confident in his life. The disciples had seen Jesus go toe-to-toe with religious leader, with more religious leaders, time and time again. When Jesus always seemed to just be unflinching in a moment to maybe heal someone, cast out a demon, perform a miracle. He's multiplied loaves of bread and fish. He's healed the lame. He's even commanded the dead to rise in complete confidence. But we've never seen Jesus like this. Even after this, we see Jesus such confidence in the face of Caiaphas, the high priest, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, even the crowd that's ridiculing him. But now, something's different with Jesus. Something, dare I say, has him spooked. So why is this? Why now? that he's sorrowful to death. Look at verse 36. And he said, Abba, Dad, Father, all things are possible for you. You can do anything. But if it's possible, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will and you know, so there's our answer. What, what is about this moment that, that has Jesus in such deep grief? It's this cup. 
What is that? You know, in the Old Testament, it speaks of this, this, this cup of God's displeasure, this cup of God's wrath, this cup of God's judgment against evil, against sin. And in Psalm 75, 8, it says, For there is a cup in the Lord's hand, and it's full of, with, of wine blended with uh, spices, and he pours from it, and all the wicked of the earth will drink, draining it to his dregs. And so this cup is God's righteous, holy displeasure, anger, wrath, judgment towards sin and evil. Right? He's a righteous and holy God. And he can't just like say to the evil of the world like, hey, that's fine. No biggie. That wouldn't be actually a very good God. And so God's justice is like in this cup. God's wrath is in this cup. One, one author says this. He says, it's like all the fury of a volcanic eruption concentrated in a coffee mug. And this is the source of Jesus' anxiety in distre- and distress. And so in this moment when Jesus says, man, if it's possible, take this cup, take this moment, take this this judgment from me, it's because this cup is being extended out to Jesus of God's justice, of God's displeasure and, and wrath towards sin. Not towards Jesus' sin. It's, because not, it's not because of anything that Jesus has done, but it's because of something that everyone else has done. The evil and the sin of us, of the world. And this is such a heavy thing that even causes Jesus to, to sweat drops of blood. Even to, to cry out to God, man, if there's another way, if, those are, if there's anything possible that I don't have to drink this full cup down to its full measure, let's do that. Let this pass from me. But even in the midst of this, Jesus says, it's not my will, but yours. And as we just continue to follow Jesus and and his kind of path to the cross, we, we find him here in the garden praying this. And then moments later, Jesus finds himself betrayed and he's arrested. And then he will be beaten. He will be put on trial. And then eventually he will be condemned to death and he will carry his cross up a hill and he will have a uh, crown of thorns put on his head and he will have his hands and feet nailed to a cross. And then his broken and bloody body will just be hoisted up for all to see. And then it brings us to this point in Mark 15 Verse 33, as Jesus is is hanging there on the cross, and then it says this, when it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And and, um, at three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabach mothini, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you abandon me, right? Jesus, the son of God, has existed in eternal intimacy and oneness with the father, right? We, we start to feel this, this kind of tremble in the garden, and now we've seen it played out fully now while Jesus is on the cross. And for the first time in eternity, there just feels to be like a little bit of distance, a little bit of trembling within, between Jesus' intimacy between him and the Father that he had always experienced. And yeah, the physical pain of the crucifixion 
was very awful, but that's nothing in comparison to the pain that Jesus is enduring now. He's not crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me because I'm on this cross? It's, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me because the full measure of this cup is being poured out. And he's enduring all of God's justice, all of God's wrath, all of God's displeasure, all of God's righteousness against the sin and the evil of the world. And he's never felt this separation between God, between him and the Father, but now he feels it. Friends, I don't want you to miss the, the, the weight of this moment. I don't want you to miss the, the, the scandal of all of this. The only one who ever deserved complete blessing instead is getting nothing but cursed. When we look at, at Jesus on the cross and we think about it on this Friday, we, it really should bring us to this thought of like, you know what, Jesus got absolutely nothing of what he deserved, but he got everything of what I deserved. Should have been me. Should have been me. The penalty that was rightfully mine because of the sin that I've committed was put on him. And then in verse 37, it says this, it says that Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. Then, the, verse 38, then the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So again, the, the, moment, the moment that Jesus dies... What's the first thing that happens? This curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. And this curtain was in the temple and it was, it was this curtain was two feet thick and it was, there was this, you know, the temple is the place of worship for the Jews and the temple itself represented kind of the, the presence of God. They're coming here to worship God and it's like, man, God is, is in our midst in some way to some degree but there, as you got more and more to the center of the temple and at its center was this place called the Holy of Holies. And the curtain, that was the entrance into the Holy of Holies. And it was like, hey, you can't go in there. God's there. You can't go into the most holy place. You can't go into the Holy of Holies because God's presence is there. And this curtain is the thing that lets you know that you're separated from God. You know, it's like a holy, righteous God is on one side and sinful people are on the other. And at this moment in Jesus' death, the curtain miraculously tears from top to bottom, from heaven to earth, from God to us, torn in two, ripped in two by God himself. And the barrier between a holy and perfect, righteous, all-loving, all-eternal all God, the barrier between him and sinful humanity, sinful you and I, has suddenly been ripped to shreds. Think of the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. Right there, right there in the presence of God. But when they sin... Oh, something now has come between them and their relationship with God. And they are kicked out of the garden. And right now we find in Jesus' death, oh, that separation between God and humanity now has been done away with by the death of Christ. And rather than being held at arm's length because of our sin, we're welcomed into the Father's arms. The sin that separates us from God has been done away with forever because Jesus took our punishment. Jesus took our penalty. Jesus took the cup that separated us between, between us and God. You know, and, and as we just think about this, as we think of what, what has happened on that 
Friday, thousands of years ago, in a garden, eventually on a cross, and we think about what has happened to God the Son, to Jesus Christ. We look back on the cross. I just want us to think like, okay, what does that, what does that mean for you and I today? Because it's not just some story. Right? Jesus didn't just die because it made good writing. Jesus died because he accomplished something. And so for us to remember a few things here to remember as we look back in this is because Jesus died, the cup, the cup is empty. The cup is empty. God's wrath against sin has been fully satisfied, fully dealt with by the death of Jesus. You know, let's not take for granted that that cup again is meant for you and me. The pain that Jesus endured was supposed to be our pain. The, his suffering was supposed to be our suffering. His death was supposed to be our death. And that sense of guilt, that sense of separation, knowing that you're getting everything, even, even not everything that you're deserved, all went on him instead of us. It wasn't just that Jesus died for us, but it, Jesus died instead of us. And our sin, this tells us, sin is not just some trivial thing. It's not something to be made light of. You know, sin is such a big thing that Jesus had to die for it. And he was eventually nailed to a cross because of that. Because our, the problem of sin is so great, so severe, it cost the Son of God his, his own life. But tonight, we, we, in remembering that the seriousness of our sin, remember that Jesus has satisfied God's wrath towards sin completely. This is one way that an author puts it. He says, Jesus drank the entire cup, leaving not one drop. Not only will he leave nothing in the cup of wrath for us to drink, but today, you and I, we find ourselves with another cup in our hands. It's not the cup of wrath, but it's the cup of salvation. From this precious new cup, we find ourselves drinking and drinking, drinking consistently, drinking endlessly, drinking eternally, for the cup of salvation is always full and overflowing because Jesus emptied the other cup. This is the cup that we have before us is the cup of salvation that we can only find in Jesus. And so tonight, when we, I mean, that we have that. In Christ, we have salvation, and it is, it is so full, so continually pouring from the throne, from the heart, from the love of God out to us. Why? Because Jesus completely satisfied the cup of wrath for us. And so there's, if we've trusted in Christ, right, there's no wrath towards you anymore. There's not a little bit left for God to pour out on you in displeasure or in some sort of penalty or judgment. Why? Because Jesus drank all of it. It's completely empty. Another thing for us to think through is because Jesus died, the curtain was torn, and so now we have free access. Free, complete, full, confident access to God. But if you sin against somebody, you feel it relationally. We even can have this phrase of like, man, it just feels like there's something between us. Right, and that sin, when we, even when we sin today, we probably still feel it with God. It's like, man, it just feels like there's something between me and God. But the sin that separates us from God has been done away with forever. And not by our doing. Not because we somehow appeased God enough or had a great week or impressed him enough with, with anything that we could have done. But no, it's been done away with because Jesus died. The curtain has been torn. And there is no amount of sin, there's no amount of guilt, there's no amount of shame 
that can ever become between you and God. Between you and the presence of God. You've been brought into the full embrace. With your sin removed, we get so close to God. We can even just be in his arms. And so that means that the biggest, ugliest sin in your life, because I'm sure that there's something that we can all think of that we feel ashamed about. That we feel like, okay, yes, God, you may love me, but I don't know if you like me because of that. God, sure, I know that you love me, but I don't know if you really want me around because of that. But Jesus down on the cross is saying like, there is no more that. There is no more shame. Therefore, if anyone is Christ, you know, there is now no condemnation. And we have full access to the Father. And I know many times that we feel like because of our sin, we need to run away from God. But because of Jesus and his death, we always get to run to God whenever we sin. And that Jesus actually invites us to do that because he tore it down. He tore that wall of separation between us and God. This is what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. It says that, that he, God, made Jesus, the one who had not known sin, the one who did not sin, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we in Christ, in Jesus, might become the righteousness of God. In other words, when God looks at you, he doesn't see any of your accomplishments, any of your quiet times that you feel like you nailed this week or totally missed. Jesus sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus. Not because you did anything to grab onto that or, or earn it or get it. It's because Jesus gave it to you. Our sin went on him and his righteousness is credited to us. That's who we are. You know, and if you are listening tonight and, and, if, have, and you've trusted in Jesus... I just want to ask you a question. Are, do you feel weighted down by guilt? Do you feel weighted down by shame? Do you feel that maybe that God's given you some sort of stiff arm? Jesus took the curtain down. Don't put another one back up. It's gone. It's ripped in two. Right when Jesus dies, bam, it's gone. It's ripped. And so know that you are really forgiven. Really know that you are put in the Father's arm. You're always invited. You're always welcomed because of what Christ has done for you. And, you know, maybe you're listening tonight and you're thinking, man, I don't really know if I know Jesus. I don't, and maybe you haven't ever really trusted in him. You have, you've never actually really given your life to Jesus and just placed your trust in what Jesus has done for you, that he paid the price for your sin, that he died in your place. Today could be the night, the day that you give your life to Christ, that you, that you know God. And it's not because of anything that you've done, you can't earn it, it is totally by his grace. And I just encourage you, maybe this is the, you know, may, may this be the time where you're like, man, I'm, I'm done turning my back on God because he's always turned towards me and you just run to your father, run to the father, run to God because he said, man, I would rather die than live without you. And Jesus died in your place so that you could know God. And we just think, at the end of this, when we, and we just kind of go back to where we started with Jesus in a garden. When he's in deep distress, even to the point of death, but he asks a question in there and he says, Father, if it's possible, if it's possible 
Take this cup from me. If it's possible, let this moment pass and not help me to not drink it. But not my will, but yours. And we don't exactly know, it's not recorded for us in, in the text of exactly how God the Father, what he said back to Jesus. But we do know the answer when Jesus asked, if it's possible, can this cup be taken from me? We do know the answer that from the Father is, it's not possible. There's no other way. There's no other way for sinful humanity to be brought near. There's no other way for sinful people to be forgiven. There's no other way for us to reconcile our, this, this relationship and this distance between us and them. There's no other way unless you drink the cup, Jesus, unless you die. Because God could have just left us in our sin. God could have just left us in our separation. But God refused for there not to be a way. And so Jesus drank the cup so we don't have to. Jesus was abandoned so that we would never be. And this just makes me think of a song, some lyrics of a song, and well, I'll just read them to you. I'm not, not a good singer. Um, <laughs> man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed, the sin of, of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Sin of heaven, God's own son, to purchase and redeem, and to reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. And now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Thank you for being our salvation. Thank you, God, for the cross. Thank you, God, that you refused for there not to be a way for us to be saved, for us to be brought near to you, for us to be reconciled, for us to be saved, forgiven. Jesus, thank you that you, even knowing even knowing the cup that you would drink. Jesus, that you went completely willing. Lord, that there was never a moment that you thought, oh man, if I had known it would have been this bad, I wouldn't have done it. You knew. And so, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that this is the hope of our life, of our faith. Lord, that, that rugged cross, our salvation, where your Lord poured it out over us. And so, Lord, we just praise you, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.